Hi, I'm Mike Gerhauser. On behalf of the other elders and all who gather here, I want to say welcome to Resurgence Church. We are glad that you found us. Now, whether this is your first time joining us or you meet with us regularly, we pray that the message that you're about to hear would encourage you, would edify you in your faith, and would bring glory to God. We also want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you get notifications. And if you want to learn any more about us, you can go to our website at rsgchurch.com. There you can listen to past messages, you can give online, you can check our calendar of events, and you can see our statement of faith. Thank you again for joining us. Pray that you are blessed by the preaching of the word this morning. God bless you. But if everyone can stand, we're gonna, um, we'll start in our text today of Galatians chapter 1. Just let me know when we're good. Can we just start or no? Or wait? Okay. We can wait. The Facebook audience will be ready. Oh, Facebook's not starting? Well, it's recording though, right? We can eventually put it up on. Okay. All right. So um, Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 10. Uh, I'll read it out and you guys can join me if you would like. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Dear Lord, uh, I just pray, Lord, that you would bless this message. Lord, I pray that um, nothing I say is an error, um, that, that this has been carefully prepared and according to your will and good work um, through the word and through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Um, I'll just ask you to bless the, the ears of the hearers today, Lord, and um, bless their hearts and their minds today as they receive this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Get a seat. Um, so as I get started, just continue on here in the introduction. If you could all turn to 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles. Um, you know, I go through a lot of different scriptures, and it just helps if you're uh, following along. So, uh, oh, it's all right. We'll chart it to your account. Um, so a contemporary Christian author writes this. When I have doubts about my faith or deep nagging questions that keep me up at night, I don't have the luxury of finding my truth because I am committed to the truth. I want to know what is real. I want my worldview which is the lens through which I see the world, to line up with reality. God either exists or he doesn't. The Bible is his word or it's not. Jesus was raised from the dead or he wasn't. Christianity is true or it isn't. There is no my truth when it comes to God. We're going to hear again from this author later because the, the sermon does uh, involve her. But today's message is a call for us to remain committed to the gospel that saves men's souls. We just read Paul's admonishment to the churches in Galatia. And as we shall see, he also admonishes the believers in his first letter to the Corinthians. Before we go there, I have a few questions for you. Who or what do you follow? Who or what do you put your faith and trust in? Hopefully the answer is the God of the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's what we're here for. Christ is the object of our Christian faith. And I'm sure that most of us would claim this. However, there are times that we miss the mark and we forget. I far too often take my eyes off the Lord. But what does this look like sometimes? We put our trust in the government, either as a whole or in one politician, we follow another man or woman's advice instead of scripture. 
On occasion, we may be reluctant to change despite what Scripture says. Sometimes we can be found placing our hope in the next promotion or job opportunity, resting on the thought that more money will solve some or all of our problems. We can have faith in a new medication or in a medical procedure that will bring wholeness and happiness to our lives. These things all fall short. And if and when we put our trust in anything before the Lord, we are violating the first commandment, which says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The Lord passes this commandment to the Jews through Moses. And Jesus reminds his followers to focus on God first. He says in Luke chapter 12, it's also recorded in Matthew, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I may maybe miss referencing that, but sorry. It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body and what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. For all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Even in the context of a local church, there's a tendency to focus too much on one person. If you and I rely too much on one man or woman to interpret this and teach us the scriptures, we are denying the power of the Holy Spirit and denying the fullness of the word of God. And we need to be very careful to avoid that. In the first century, there were some in the church that struggled with this very thing. First Corinthians, which hopefully you're there. Chapter 1, Paul writes that there is quarreling among the church brothers. He clearly identifies the problem, calls them out, and then corrects them. Beginning in verse 12, he says, What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no, no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Paul is saying here that we don't follow the teachings or seek the loyalty of one man. We don't identify ourselves with the name of anyone but Christ. In chapter 2 of the same letter, and it's also on our on the outside window there, Paul says that he decided to know nothing among the Corinthians except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because it was Christ who hung on the cross. It was Christ who defeated death for everyone so that we may have life. And it was Christ who sent the Holy Spirit in power at the appointed time to point everyone back to Christ. Even John the Baptist, as his name indicates, did come to baptize. That's how we remember him. However, he preached the gospel in the sense that he called people to repent and seek the Lord. He didn't look for his own glory. He eventually pointed some of his own followers to become the first disciples of Jesus. Following Paul's advice, we need to avoid these divisions in the church. Let's take Pastor Mike, for example. <laughs> you ready? I didn't tell you I was going to do this. So. We all know that he's a nice guy, right? Very likable. He would do almost anything for almost anybody. And I say almost because I haven't found something he isn't willing to do yet. As a pastor and teacher, Mike is a great expositor of the scriptures. He rightly divides the word of truth, faithfully preaches the gospel, and carefully considers spiritual matters and is quick to serve. But don't, don't get too, you know, but he is a man just like us. He can make mistakes even when his motives are pure. And I'm not saying this to shake any of you and your confidence in him, but I say it because we must remain rooted in the scriptures. We have to be seeking truth from God through the Bible and through our own prayer and study. As an aside, one of the issues that Martin Luther, the great reformer, had with the dominant faith tradition of his time, the Roman Catholic Church, was that the scriptures existed in Latin and the songs that the churchgoers sang were in Latin. There's only just one problem with that. The common people didn't understand Latin. Luther called for scriptures and hymns to be written in the vernacular or the common tongue so that the people could read, listen, learn, and understand the things of God. 
In his time, only the priest class could learn, understand, and teach the scriptures. And I praise God that we live in a time and place that we don't have to struggle to find the scripture in our common language. And there are so many resources at our disposal to learn more of the word of God. Later in uh, the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about Christ being the wisdom and power of God. Starting in verse 26, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Two points are important here. First, it's an encouragement to us that we, common people, right? Those of us that are of little social influence, not on any Forbes list. If you look at those, some of them, like they make your head spin around. And we don't, not many of us, I don't know, have PhDs after our name. But we can be used by God the way he sees fit. He uses the foolish to shame the wise and he uses the poor to shame the rich. He chooses the weak to shame the strong. How does he do this? We can read and understand the word of God. We can pray and act in accordance with with the faith that he has given us, we can lift up our brother and sister that are hurting right now. Because of God's grace, we are in Christ Jesus. And therefore, we cannot boast in ourselves, but in the Lord. The second important thing is that Paul is saying that we should not boast in any other man. Remember, he was still writing to the quarreling Christians. This is just a continuation of the same chapter. For that reason, he is reminding us not to boast in Apollos, Cephas, who's Peter, himself, Paul, or any one person. We don't boast in Mike's righteousness, and we don't take credit for the great things that another man or woman has accomplished. We boast in the finished work of Christ on the cross. I know we have a lot of you know young people in the church, those that have aged out of Sunday school, and those that are uh, you know find it maybe difficult to listen to these messages. They're, they could be a little long, but just remember that you don't boast in what your friends or your peers do. Um, don't be a follower of, of anyone in school or uh, in your social circles. That's for free. That's not in the message. <clears throat> um, it's, a, it's a good way to go down a, the wrong path. So we put too much stock in one man or woman, even a pastor. And uh, I bring this up because this a book that I just read. Um, and I want to pivot on this point of divisions in the church, which could happen because of one influential person. So the opening quote that I gave was by an evangelical author and her name is Elisa, uh, yeah, Elisa Childers. Um, she wrote a book called Another Gospel, which is a reference to the main text in Galatians chapter one. And the book is subtitled, A Lifelong Christian Seeks Truth in Response to Progressive Christianity. And I would put this book in a subcategory called Spiritual Autobiography. And she's not, um, she's not that old. I would say um, she's probably in her 40s. Um, so, you know, she's just, she just gone through a lot and wrote this really compelling work. So in this book, uh, Childers purposefully labels her, her faith as that of historic Christianity. Because her faith was at one point traditional faith, and then it was challenged and torn down before finally it was built up again. And Childers began her journey as a child, her faith journey as a, a child in a strong faith uh, household. Um, her parents were both Christians, um, and they, they lived and modeled a life of servitude. Um, they were doers of the word, not just uh, hearers of the word. They actually lived out their Christianity, and she, she lived this with them. As an adolescent, uh, Childers was uh, the lead singer for a Christian teen pop and pop rock band, um, Zoe Girl. Does anyone anyone remember that? Um, I don't know about it until I read this book, but maybe you know. So she was a Christ follower and didn't question her faith. As an adult, she started attending a church where, with her husband, and they became connected to the pastor and the church community. 
And this pastor was the influential person in her life that led an invitation only. That's sometimes a little, you should be watch out for that. Invitation only group of churchgoers through a class that included herself. And the pastor made the class feel really special. He labeled and called them peculiar people and out of the box thinkers. This class, little did they know, was intended to question and ultimately deconstruct the tenets of the Christian faith. In fact, the pastor who was preaching Christian messages each and every Sunday called himself a hopeful agnostic. Thankfully, Childers continued to search the scriptures. She did not bury her head in the sand when faced with tough questions about her faith, even when she was the only one kind of questioning what was happening in this class. And she saw at solid ground when the foundations of historically accepted Christian beliefs were shaken. She only remained in the class a few months. It was a, the class lasted a few years. The class left what some of what she calls pebbles in her shoe. You know how it feels when you walk and you have a pebble in your shoe? You can't ignore that it's there, right? If you're standing still, maybe. But when you try to move, you cannot ignore the fact that there's a rock in there. And after she stopped attending the class, her, uh, she and her husband left that church. And the pastor continued, as I said, to teach this class for a couple of more years. And then he and the church embraced what is known as progressive Christianity. If you don't know what it is, you'll know today. What exactly is it? And what do their churches and adherents believe? What do they teach? They have the word Christianity in them, right? You may think about progressivism as a political movement. And you are right that it is. It began as a philosophical movement, however. Progressivism, as defined by gotquestions.org, that's another great resource. It's a multifaceted philosophy advocating progress and change, as opposed to main maintaining things as they are. Progressives work toward what they hope will, better, will be better conditions, implement what they consider more enlightened ideas, and try new or experimental methods to facilitate change. We often associate progressivism with liberalism. But we all like progress, right? So what's the problem? Well, if you don't understand what the philosophy of the movement is, you can easily make a wrong judgment. Quick history lesson. The age of the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries, where they missed the mark, the thinkers from that day, is that they, they thought the, the faith, their faith in the goodness of man would bring progress on. And this is also called secular humanism. Those thinkers valued empirical knowledge, you know, things that we can uh, see and sense and do, you know, scientific studies on, um, as the foundation of society, which is why the sciences flourished during this time period. Where does progressivism and Christianity converge? How did this new philosophy take shape? Childers writes in her book that progressive Christians tend to avoid absolutes and are typically not united around creeds or belief statements. Because of this, it might be more helpful to look for certain signs, moods, and attitudes toward God and the Bible when trying to spot it. See, they say that if you have a belief statement that's in black and white and it's written down, that's very exclusionary and it leaves other things out. And they want to keep the door open for every new wind of doctrine, which is directly in scripture, things that we need to watch out for. There would be a time in America when a church like the one Childers stopped attending would have not been possible, or at least it would have been very rare. Another quick history lesson. In the last quarter of the 20th century, back in the 1900s, most of us were born, there was a move away from religion and towards secularism. Remember that the Age of Enlightenment was happening 100 to 150 years prior. In this new secular age, there was a push to separate church and state. The removal of church authority from educational institutions, big colleges that we know of like Harvard, Princeton, they were set up to study the Bible and to train uh, pastors. And even a push to strip re the religion out of church ministries, believe it or not. This in turn provided a generation of citizens that viewed the world without the influence and benefit of a Christian worldview. One of the results of the secular secularized worldview was the rise of pluralism. Quoting from a book called Church History in Plain Language, the author Bruce Shelley writes, Contemporary Americans are confronted with a wide variety of religions and spiritual experiences, each claiming to define reality. 
secularization has in, in effect undercut any reasonable Christian definition and the man or woman on the street is left with a religious faith defined by inner feelings. And I am talking about this today so that we can spot it when it comes up. Church, not all of the organizations and institutions out there are as they present themselves. You cannot have a belief system or worldview that differs on the key points, but then you slap a Christian-y bumper sticker on it that says, let go and let God. And then we say, oh, they must be Christians. We are no longer living in an age when a church can talk about Jesus and we would call them a solid Christian institution. There are more reasons why I'm talking about this, which I'll, I will end with. But for now, is everyone okay so far? Not too heavy, right? So progressive Christians are generally unified when it comes to three topics. And it's not in a good way. The Bible, the cross, and the gospel. They deny the, liter the inerrancy of scripture, even though they'll say, we really do, we read the scriptures and they're important, but they, they don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. In the cross, because they actually do say that the cross is an example of divine child abuse if Jesus is the son of God, um, but they still, they still uh, lift up Jesus somehow in their minds. Um, and the gospel, because the gospel to them is not what it is to us. This author, Alyssa Childers, continues in her book. She says, for example, progressive Christians view the Bible as primarily a human book and emphasize personal conscience and practices rather than certainty and beliefs. They are also very open to redefining, reinterpreting, or even rejecting essential doctrines of the faith, like the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus, and his bodily resurrection. In most cases, progressive Christians focus on social justice and environmentalism and often include a revisionist or non-traditional view of the scriptures, as I mentioned. Now you can see how the politically liberal and those that call themselves progressives can get behind a church that calls for social justice and fighting climate change. But I'm not here to make a political point or to take a stand on policy of our government on those things that I mentioned. But I want to bring the theological movement into focus to shed light on it so that you can see it and recognize it. So we have these, that, these people that are outside the progressive Christian church defining it. But how do the people on the inside define it? How do, they, um, how do the adherents of this faith believe that it, uh, how does it look? So one, one church in America that labels themselves a progressive Christian church and they also make use of the phrase emergent church. They were kind of the two streams that came together. So they're, I would say they're synonymous. But on their About Us Statements of Belief page, I'm going to read directly from their website. And the important thing here is not that you, you boycott or never attend this church. You probably won't because it's in the northwest region of the United States. Um, and judging by the outside of the church, you'd probably never go there if I know you guys. But... I want to uh, walk you through this just as an exercise um, in spotting some biblical misinterpretation. So the heading at the top of this page, it says about us beliefs, says uh, progressive Christian beliefs are rooted in Jesus. We're good so far, right? General description. I'll try to show you when I'm reading from their website and when I'm commenting, but this is from their website. We believe in the Trinity, God, the creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus's commandment to love one another as I have loved you is foundational. Now, I originally thought, okay, yes, I just read it kind of quickly. I wrote it down, but then I caught the nuance that God is the creator. Jesus is not the creator by exclusion. He is part of the created order, which is antithetical. Is that the right word? Antithetical to what we believe? We know that Jesus, everything was created through him and for him. He was their creation. So he is not created. Neither he nor the Holy Spirit carry the title God on their page. We believe that God is three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons perfectly united. Okay, back to their website. We are comfortable acting on our faith. Sorry, we are more comfortable acting on our faith than talking about it. With this statement, you can see what argument they are going to reach for. 
But in order to act on your faith, you need to be comfortable talking about it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I believe that there is a simple reason for them making actions greater than words so that they can show their, their piety, their righteousness. And the reason why the author, Childers, had so much trouble in this class is because she had these beliefs, but she didn't know why she believed them. And this, that's how she had to basically go back and rebuild her, her faith. Okay, back to their website. Um, St. Francis of Assisi's uh, wisdom, preach the gospel always and when necessary use words, resonates deeply. We believe that Christian faith is a journey, not a destination. We think of ourselves as work in progress Christians. I think we can get behind those beliefs. I left that in there just to say, okay, we're good. Um, next, we believe that God's will and way were revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that the historical Jesus, the Jewish rabbi carpenter who lived in ancient Palestine, became the Christ as his followers encountered him in their midst after his earthly death. The Holy Spirit awakened them to the power of Jesus' presence in their midst. Jesus came alive when they trusted that his love, guidance, support, comfort, and challenge remained with them, even, uh, even though his physical body did not. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection provide the inspiration and challenge for us to live as followers of Jesus today. I see Mike nodding and Carl going like this. So that's opposite, but I think you both think the same thing. So did anyone catch the three errors? Three things. At first, I only caught two. Then I was like, wait a minute. So point number one, we know that Jesus did not become the Christ. Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, as we are told in Revelation 13.8. 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. And John tells us in his gospel that Jesus, also called the word of God, was with God in the beginning. Point number two, Jesus coming alive had nothing to do with the disciples' trust. He came alive at the appointed time. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So again, what their words say is Jesus came alive when they trusted that his love, guidance, support, and comfort and challenge remained with them, even though his physical body did not. Point number three. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are not most important in that they inspire and challenge us. That's not why they're important to us. They may inspire and challenge us, but his sinless life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection are what we call the substitutionary atonement. Loretta said it today in worship. He took our punishment. He gave us his heavenly blessings, including eternal life. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, we are up there with him. Our flesh is crucified with Christ. And when he comes alive, our spirits come alive. Okay. I didn't even get to the specific headings yet, but their progressive beliefs say, number one, the Christian faith is founded on three primary calls we see through Jesus, to love God, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. And I would say we would wholeheartedly agree with the first two, but not the last. And I'm not sure how they justify Jesus modeling love for himself. Um, they don't really say why, but he was willing to be punished and punish his body because he loved the unredeemed sinner, you and I, more than he loved himself. Romans 5, 6, Christ died for the ungodly. Also in response to his relation to Abraham in John chapter 8, Jesus answers, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. So I'm not going to hammer them too hard on this point because I don't really see how they get there, but I disagree. Number two on their page, this the Christian faith is our way of being faithful to God, but it is not the only way. Okay. Christianity is the truth for us, but is not the only truth. Right on their page. 
So my one response to this is John 14, 6. And if you don't know that verse, please look it up and memorize it. It's very easy to memorize. What is their reason for this belief? They provide it. The, this principle stems from the reality of the 21st century. There you have it. It's new. It's new, new beliefs. We share our lives with people who are Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist. Now, just quickly to pull away from them. It's always been the case that there have been many beliefs, right? Many languages since the Tower of Babel. Many faith systems. We experience these people as loving and caring by following their religious traditions. To deny that is to deny that God can only draw people with one way. That simply isn't borne out in our experience. Well, I would say if there was some, oh, well, not what I would say, what the Bible would say. If there was some other way to be reconciled to God, then Christ would not have to have died for us. Then it would be divine child abuse just to, just to do it for no good reason. Also, these different faith traditions directly contradict each other. So there is no way for them to all be true together. Muslims have a different Jesus than Christians do. Paul tells us that no one could be made righteous by the law, which eliminates the Jews from salvation apart from Christ. Prior to Christ, they still had to look to Christ. He just wasn't manifested yet in the flesh. Hinduism, instead of teaching resurrection, embraces reincarnation. Instead of one life, one death, and an eventual immortal body, Hindu reincarnation involves multiple lives, multiple deaths, and no immortality, no immortal body. The power of the Christian... Oh, back to their website. I'm sorry if it's uh, <laughs> making you sick. But the power of the Christian faith to transform lives does not require it to be exclusively true. Exclusivity is born out of fear. The fear that there is one train to God, and if you aren't on the right train, you'll go to hell. We believe there are many trains, and God welcomes them all. Jesus would disagree, frankly. In Matthew 7, 13, and 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That's why it's so precious. Another point of belief on the website that uh, has to do with treating the environment well, and the Bible does call us to be good stewards, but one must carefully consider the risks and benefits when considering public policies regarding the environment. Sometimes they do more harm than good. They just have the appearance of doing good. Number four point on their site, love of neighbor means extending kindness and care to those in our family and in our local and global communities, okay? Further, love of neighbor includes affirmation of the LBGTQ community, immigrants, people of other faith traditions, and even those who are enemies. Now, I'll say that the word tolerance is sometimes used instead of the phrase kindness and care. Unfortunately, historic or traditional or biblical Christianity is generally not tolerated by people that preach the kindness and care gospel. Alisa, Alisa Childers and others point out that progressive Christians do not hold scripture in high regard. And I would agree with this by citing evidence from another website, which I'm not going to go into all the points, but it's called progressivechristianity.org. And in, on that site, they make a point, they'll, they'll make a theological point for their faith. They'll list three or four different scriptures that support the point. And then explain the idea with some other words. But they just give the reference. They don't actually give the scripture. And I just looked at a few of them. I don't really see how the arguments can, that they make can be deduced from the scripture. It's just they give the verse that may have something to do with that. And then they say this is why. So if you just blindly trusted what they put on the site and you never looked into it, you could fall into that trap. And that's why I'm saying that we need to read and seek understanding and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. We must verify everything that we or anyone else says with scripture. If you could turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, uh, we're going to spend some time there. 1 Timothy. As I said in the last cultural conversation message, I don't want to focus on the problems or issues that I see in the culture, and that includes the theological and philosophical problems. I want to keep pointing you and us back to scripture. I want to show you that the path that the Holy Spirit provides through the word of God. 
is the truth. I want you to know that Jesus Christ, I want you to know Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul says, because that is what will sustain you through the confusion of postmodern pluralism. So let's begin with 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is writing to Timothy, and this is the first of the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And we're going to start in verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Let's stop there. So progressive Christianity doesn't keep the sincere faith in high regard, right? As you, can, as you heard some of the examples, they value actions over beliefs. Progressive Christianity doesn't make confident assertions either. They kind of let in everything and just kind of roll with it. One of the hallmarks of progressive Christianity is questioning all things that really have been settled for thousands of years now. At least maybe in our hearts and minds, they've been settled. They, that includes the primary doctrines of the faith, things that we would say are not negotiable. And I want to just pause here and give a disclaimer because I realized the, whole, the Holy Spirit was convicting me as I was writing this, that it's okay to have doubts. It's okay to question the beliefs of the faith. That's, what, that's why we teach each other. That's why we're available. Um, and I say we, but really anyone in the church, you're all teachers of the word. And we need to keep digging into the word and looking for these, uh, looking for answers to tough questions, as we'll come back to. Back to uh, the scripture, verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, don't do that, kids, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So progressive Christianity embraces homosexuality and other parts of the LGBTQ plus spectrum. And what's interesting is that they pick out that one sin in that whole list that I just read from first Timothy. And they say, no, that's okay. But the other stuff, they wouldn't say murdering is okay. And they wouldn't say that, you know, children hitting their mothers and fathers or, you know, grown people hitting their mothers and fathers, that's not okay. But Paul clearly does not agree with the progressive Christians today. Verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to, to his serve, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Progressive Christians, they would celebrate Paul for his changed life. They would say, you found oneness or you are on the path to wholeness and healing. The problem is they just don't agree with his words in all the letters of, of the scriptures, right? They don't, they don't agree. I actually saw them say this, that um, they dis. They don't believe that the words that we claim that Jesus said are his words. They say that he was too inclusive and loving to say some of the harsh things that we would say, this is what Jesus said. So those red letters, they, they don't follow that. Generally speaking, 
progressive Christian progressive Christian teachers, they use the Bible to support their pluralistic and postmodern ideas. But like I said, they don't agree with the truth claims of the Bible. I'm just going to jump to chapter two of first Timothy verse five and six. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This is very simple. And it states that there is one God and there is one person that gives us access to that one God, right? Jesus Christ, God who became man. Again, there are not many paths to oneness as most progressive Christian teachers claim. And I don't see the need to continue in First Timothy, but pretty much if you read through it, you're going to expose a lot of this. Um, and I would urge you to read those two books, which are very short, right? And they, they provide me with much encouragement um, in this kind of seeking after the truth and what is, what is not truth. But I'm going to end today with telling you why I'm preaching this message. Maybe you figured out or you already thought of some of these reasons and why you should care. One, this message should be an encouragement to you, the believer. And there is a source of truth. The psalmist says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We can take, uh, we can have faith that the word of God is true. Second, if you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, know that we are not making this up or out of thin air or from our own philosophical manifestations. You, know, you can know God through Jesus Christ, and he is the hope that we have for salvation. It does not depend on your good works to get salvation, nor to keep it. Three, as pastors and elders, it is our job to shepherd the flock. I know this is a metaphor, right? But this involves protecting and nurturing the flock, the people of God. And by warning you of the dangers of false teaching, I am hoping that you don't just wander into it. And by hearing affirmations of the gospel that has been handed down, you are taught and fed with the truth. Number four, the Bible says that we need to train up our children in the way they should go. And when they grew up, they will not depart. And you and I are all children, children in the faith. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Number five, our worldview matters and our words matter. If you want a quotable from this sermon, you can put this on your social media. Postmodernism is the smoothest road to hell. That was going to be my title, but I want it to be more specific. So maybe I'll talk about some other postmodernism another time. But again, Postmodernism is a philosophy or a worldview that says there are many different truths, not only one, and that what is true for you may not be true, may not be the same truth for me, and there is nothing contradictory about that. Number six, and the last reason why, is we are warned of attacks from inside the church by scripture and by church fathers. Uh, Elisa Childers quotes Irenaeus in the fifth chapter of her book from his work called Against Heresies. Irenaeus is railing against the Gnostic heresy of his time in the second century. But his words are appropriate in this time as well. He was writing about self-professed Christians who were determined to change the faith from within. He wrote, These men falsify the oracles of God and prove themselves evil interpreters of the good word of revelation. They also overthrow the faith of many by drawing them away under a pretense of knowledge from him who founded and adorned the universe as if they had something more excellent and sublime to reveal than that God who created the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein. There's nothing, there's nothing new under the sun, but there's nothing new or more, um, more amazing than the God who created everything, right? And this is his book. Childers summarizes their behavior by saying, they twisted the scriptures and misrepresented tradition. And Jesus warns us about these false teachers in Matthew chapter seven. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, 
but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And what does Jesus say about the people who have a misplaced faith? He continues on, verse 21 of chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Again, works righteousness. And then I, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And what are we to do with the words of Jesus? He tells us what happens in the end. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a foolish man who built his house. I'm sorry, I think I misread that. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Church, two final thoughts that we should consider. On the Gospel Coalition website, I found uh, an author who is reviewing the book that I talked a lot about, and he says, it'd be foolish to dismiss the real critiques progressive Christians raise about certain evangelical churches, but it would be equally foolish to adopt their solutions. Instead, we should seek to reform our hearts and our churches to be more like Christ Jesus. And this is done through the historic faith that's been passed down, not in spite of it. And the last point, when I said earlier that I want you to see false doctrine and recognize it, ultimately you must make a decision going forth from now. You must choose to engage it purposefully or avoid it altogether. If, you, if we land somewhere in the middle, we will be... We will be left very confused. We will have doubts as we walk out our faith, but there are solid answers to many of our toughest questions, and God is faithful to provide what we need most. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it does not change um, despite the attacks from within the church and outside the church, Lord. I thank you that we can come together with brothers and sisters that call themselves Christians that hold the essential doctrines of the faith. That we can come together with them, that we can have disagreements and still be in the same family of God. I pray, Lord, that you would give us discernment, Lord, give us wisdom as we um, dig into your scriptures, Lord, as we speak with one another, Lord. I pray that our words would be seasoned with grace. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us that illumination as we read the scriptures, Lord, that, um, that even we would remember to pray before we uh, read that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the word. That you would allow the confusion to be... Um, to, wa to be washed away, Lord, by, by your word. Sprinkle us, Lord, with your, uh, with your goodness as um, our hearts are sprinkled. As we look into your word, Lord, and, and seek these truths, Lord. And give us just, give us the truth that we need for our simple day in and day out lives, Lord. Sometimes we don't need a huge doctrinal theological point, but we just need you to lift us up, to lift our heavy hearts as mine was yesterday, Lord. And as many of our hearts are today, Lord. Pray that you would lift us up, Lord. Give us eyes to see Christ on the cross, Lord, not as a defeated person, but as a victorious Savior, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.